Hello and welcome to another exciting installment of Deviance and Social Control. I'm your host, Danielle McCartney, and today we're going to talk about control theories. Let's get started. Social control theories of deviance got their start from early classical rational choice type theories, usually associated with Cesar Beccaria. These early theories in criminology believe that individuals are rational actors who make selfish choices, choices that benefit them, and that they have the free will to make such choices. Okay, so hold up just a second. A quick aside. The theory that drives much of the American criminal justice system, deterrence theory, was inspired by Beccaria. And Beccaria said that punishment could be used to deter crimes not only because it punishes the criminal, but because it also sends a message to other potential wrongdoers. Beccaria argued that for punishment to be an effective deterrent to crime, punishment must be swift, it must be certain, and it must be severe. In the U.S., we have certainly taken on the severe part. We have longer and more punitive sentences than most of the rest of the world. But our criminal justice system is not designed to administer punishment swiftly. We want to make sure we punish the right person. So we have a long process of evidence gathering, trials, and appeals. That means when punishment is finally administered, it is not swift, if it happens at all. Many people arrested for crimes can plead out. They can plead guilty to a lesser crime or for a lower sentence or for some other consideration. Punishment is also not certain. Although there are plenty of scripted crime TV shows showing that the cops always catch the bad guy, in real life, we don't have easy access to some kind of mass spectrometer that can analyze the DNA from saliva in gum stuck to the victim's shoe. And even if we did, it would take months to process. So yeah, not swift, not certain, but we've got severe down pat. Unfortunately, satisfying only one of these three components means that punishment won't work as a deterrent. Anyhow, okay, back to control theories. What control theories took from Beccaria is the notion that being free actors Individuals need controls in their lives to keep them from hedonistic, self-serving action, at least if that action is harmful to society. Control theorists assert that human beings are basically antisocial and assume that deviance is part of the natural order of society. Being selfish beings, we are motivated to deviate and to violate norms. Therefore, according to control theorists, because we're all motivated to be deviant, the question is not why do people deviate from norms, but why do we obey the rules at all? And control can come from inside us, so that is, it could be self-control or internal control, or control can come from outside us, so social control or external control. Our first theory of social control focuses specifically on those different kinds of internal or external controls. Like many criminologists, Ivan Nye studied juvenile delinquency to theorize about deviance and social control. Nye's argument is that most deviant behavior is the result of insufficient social control. In the 1950s, Nye conducted formal interviews with 780 juveniles in Washington state. As a note, his sample was criticized for not selecting urban youths and for only selecting individuals who were likely to describe their families unfavorably. And that's going to become important in a minute <laughs> because Nye focused on the family unit as a source of control. So selecting youths with negative views of their family probably influenced his results. Nevertheless, Nye discovered some pretty cool stuff. He discovered that youth may be directly controlled through constraints imposed by parents, through limits on the opportunity for delinquency, or through parental rewards and punishments. Youth may also be constrained when they are free from direct control because they anticipate parental disapproval or through the development of a conscience and an internal constraint on behavior. So although Nye focused on youth, 
I encourage you to think about how these various types of control work in your life as an adult. So Nye outlined three basic types of control, direct control, indirect control, and internal control. He did discuss a fourth mechanism that we need a reason not to engage in deviant behavior. So we need some alternative and positively sanctioned means to satisfy our desires. But that last point is better articulated in the next theory we'll discuss, so I'm not going to focus on that one. So direct control. Direct control is the use of punishments and rewards to incentivize particular behaviors. Punishment, disapproval, ridicule, ostracism, or banishment are all used by informal groups or society as a whole to control deviant behavior. People in authority, such as police officers, probation officers, judges, or correctional officials, use formal sanction, that is punishment, as a method of direct control. Our friends, family, and even strangers use informal sanctions, such as disapproval and ridicule, to control our behavior and let us know that what we're doing is not okay. If you've ever tried a norm-breaking exercise from intro to sociology or intro to psych, you've experienced this kind of direct control. I regularly ask students to break very minor norms like entering an elevator and not turning to face the doors or wearing shoes on your hands or sitting too close to a stranger just to see what the reaction is. And all those dirty looks and heavy sighs and uncomfortable body language are informal sanctions aimed at getting us to stop doing what we're doing. Even the reward I give students by way of a grade for that assignment is an example of direct control. Without the assignment and grade, I really doubt my students would have done the ridiculous things that I suggested for that exercise. Okay, so next is indirect control. This is the affectionate identification with individuals who adhere to social norms. This is really about the influence of our primary caretakers. Not only do parents and other primary caretakers teach children about norms and values that they hope the children will internalize and act on without direction, that's the next control we're going to cover, parents and caretakers show disapproval of their children's behavior. If the child cares about their parents' approval or disapproval, the child will be less likely to engage in activities the parent disapproves of. So my child, even to this day, is more worried about when I say I am disappointed than when I am outright angry. That is an indirect control. When we try to avoid disappointing our parents or primary caregivers, we are engaging in indirect control. So when we're about to do something dodgy and we think about the look on our mom's face and stop ourselves from doing that dodgy thing, we are experiencing indirect control. Okay, so next is internal control. This is the manipulation of an individual's conscience or sense of guilt to encourage conformity. Internalized control comes from our own efforts to prevent ourselves from engaging in deviant behavior. Throughout our life, many social institutions, the family, the government, our workplace, our schools, teach us the norms and rules of our society. If we genuinely internalize these rules and act on them ourselves, there is no need for any external control. We'll, we'll all just do the right thing according to the norms of our society. That makes this method the most powerful form of social control. However, this kind of internalized control is never completely effective. As we all know, there are a variety of different norms in society. Some of those expectations for behavior contradict themselves. For example, is a single parent supposed to spend all their time nurturing their child? Or are they supposed to leave their child in someone else's care so they can work? Both nurturing children and working are expected of single parents. And many of us are involved in different subcultures, which teach us norms that are different from or even contradict the norms of the larger society. And of course, if you get a group of people together and ask them what the quote unquote right thing to do is in a particular situation, 
you'll get as many different answers as people in the group. All right, so there you go. That's all the different forms. Well, probably not all the different forms, but lots of different forms of control. Now we're gonna move on to a social bond theory by Travis Hershey. When criminologists talk about control theory, they're usually referring to Travis Hershey's social bond theory. And this is not a theory of what causes crime, but a theory of pro-social behavior, a theory that explains why we conform to the rules. So I want you to think of a time that you could have broken the rules or you could have broken the law, but you didn't. Why didn't you? So just take a moment and jot down what you were thinking, what you were doing that stopped you from breaking those rules, even though you had the opportunity to do it and you didn't do it. Okay, so Hershey argued that when we engage in deviant or criminal behavior, it is because we have weak or broken bonds to society. So people break the law because they have not internalized society's rules. Internalization requires strong social bonds to groups in society, like family, and to institutions, like schools and jobs. So social bonds do not reduce criminal motivation they increase one's ability to resist the temptation of crime or deviance. So with a nod to differential association theory, Hershey argued that social bonds remain strong only so long as they are nourished by interaction with conventional others, with other rule followers. So overall, Hershey argued that the presence and strength of social bonds can explain various levels of offending. If you watched the social learning or strain videos, you'll see that Hershey is challenging Sutherland's and Merton's theories, both of which argue that elements of social structure pushed or pulled people into crime. Hershey, on the other hand, says we're always pulled toward crime and something stops us. What differentiates offenders from non-offenders are the factors that restrain people from acting on those wayward impulses. Social bonds are the social controls that regulate those criminal or deviant impulses. Hershey discussed four social bonds that promote socialization and the internalization of social norms and conformity. And those are attachment, commitment, involvement, and belief. Up first is attachment. Attachment is the emotional bond. Attachment and sensitivity toward conventional significant others, such as parents, teachers, peers. Attachment to rule-following people who are important to us leads us to avoid their disapproval. This is the source of our conscience. We internalize the norms and values of people we respect and who care for us. We identify with and emulate the people who take care of us. If you remember from the discussion of Nye's framing of social control, this is indirect control. Closeness to important rule followers in our life leads us to care about their opinion, including their disapproval of our bad behavior. So as youths, we do not offend because we do not want to disappoint our parents or others that we're attached to, such as our teachers. Others become the source of our conscience. So the voice in our head telling us what's right or what we should do. That's our conscience. It comes from other people. So now thinking back to that time that you totally could have broken the law or the rules, but you didn't. Did you have your parents' voice in your head? Were you thinking about how important people in your life would disapprove? Did that contribute to why you didn't offend? Okay, up next is the material bond, commitment. This social bond argues that deviance places conventional investments at risk, so not offending is a rational choice. This bond is our stake in conformity. It, it represents our commitment to a particular socially approved line of action and shows that we understand the ramifications of pursuing unconventional or deviant behaviors. 
every time we put energy into achieving conventional goals, we reinforce this bond. When we put effort into getting good grades at school, when we invest in the human capital necessary to get a good job, a job approved of by our society, it reinforces our stake in conformity and shows our commitment to conformity. When we invest in social capital, those resources or benefits that are gained from and transferred through our social network of relationships and connections, we also reinforce our stake in conformity and following the rules. The social capital shows our social and community standing. If we were to engage in deviant or criminal behavior, we would risk damaging our social status. So, okay, thinking again about that time you could have broken the rules, but you didn't. Were you thinking about your social status or about how hard you'd worked to achieve what you had and that breaking that rule might jeopardize what you worked for? If so, it was this bond, the, the material bond commitment that was preventing you from engaging in deviant behavior. Okay, so the next bond is involvement. This is the temporal bond. This social bond really has to do with not having enough time to engage in deviant or criminal behavior. When we are involved in the legitimate use of our time and energy, we have less time for illegitimate activities. So have you heard the phrase, idle hands are the devil's workshop? That's the argument behind the bond of involvement. When we have too much idle time, we're more likely to simply have the time to engage in deviant and criminal behavior. So too much leisure time leads to problems. When we're involved in conventional activities like homework and work and sports, school activities and other recreational pursuits, we just have less time for deviance. So this bond may not explain why you didn't engage in rule breaking, not all on its own, but that time when you didn't break the rules, were you just too busy fulfilling other conventional responsibilities? This is a rough one because being involved in other activities implies that you won't have the opportunity to be presented with a rule breaking possibility. Nonetheless, there's a good chance that you just had other things to do. You were occupied. You were engaged in other activities that didn't allow you to think of the idea of rule breaking. Okay, now on to the moral social bond, belief. This bond prevents us from engaging in deviant behavior because we believe in the rightness of conventional rules and we believe that those rules should be followed. We believe in the common value system in our society and, and we accept the moral validity of that central social value system. So we embrace the moral validity of the law and other conventional norms, such as, you know, school rules or workplace expectations. So we, we believe in the value of education. For example, we respect the law. We respect lawmakers and law enforcement. And when we believe in the moral order of our society, we lack those neutralization techniques that justify the act of deviance. If you saw the social learning video, you'll remember all those ways we rationalize our wrongdoing. But when we believe in the moral order, we might not even think of reasons why it's okay to break the rules. And if we do think of those reasons, we won't act on them. So moral beliefs restrain impulses to offend. And on the other hand, crime occurs when such conventional beliefs are weakened. So thinking about that time, you could have broken the rules and didn't. Were you thinking something like, that's just wrong. That's not okay. I'm not going to do it. If so, then you were being constrained by this moral bond of belief. Okay, they, that's it. Thank you very much, Hershey, and your bond, social bond theory. We are moving on to a collaboration that Hershey did with Michael R. Gottfriedson, self-control theory. So Hershey collaborated with Gottfriedson to propose what they called a general theory of crime, meaning that lack of self-control can explain all kinds of criminal behavior. The main argument of self-control theory is that the origin of crime is low self-control, which results from inadequate, ineffective, and inconsistent socialization, 
primarily by parents early in childhood. They argued that because all crime or deviant behavior flows from low self-control, people with low self-control are likely to engage in a variety of criminal and non-criminal acts. So offenders are more likely to also be involved in non-criminal acts like accidents or household fires, car crashes, unwanted pregnancies, and so on. Gottfriedson and Hershey pointed to several characteristics of people who engage in criminal behavior that support their argument that the driving factor in criminal and deviant behavior is low self-control. So let's talk about these elements of low self-control. First, criminal acts provide immediate gratification of desires. People with low self-control tend to have a concrete here and now orientation, they argue. Those people are not likely to defer gratification and put off their short-term desires for long-term goals. This characteristic is not restricted to criminal activity, so people with low self-control are also likely to engage in other short-term satisfaction of impulses. They're more likely to smoke or drink or do drugs, gamble, have sex with multiple partners, and so on. That's a reflection of giving in to an immediate gratification of desires. Similarly, criminal acts provide easy or simple gratification of desires. So people with low self-control tend to lack diligence and tenacity and persistence. This is related to the previous point about instant gratification, but this point relates more to the difficulty of a task. So finishing college, getting a job, earning status and stability are not only long-term prospects, but difficult prospects. Finishing school takes persistence and prolonged effort. People who turn to crime then don't have the tenacity to pursue difficult tasks and turn instead to simpler desires. Criminal acts are also exciting and risky and thrilling. Criminal acts involve stealth, danger, speed, agility, deception, or power. People with low self-control, therefore, tend to be adventuresome, active, and physical. They're drawn to high-risk activities. This tendency is not, again, just about criminal adventures, but about being attracted to all kinds of risky and adventurous activities, like driving too fast, or rock climbing, or joyriding. Crimes have few or meager long-term benefits, especially compared to a job or a career. Crimes actually interfere with long-term commitments to jobs, to marriages, family, friends. So people with low self-control tend to have unstable marriages, unstable friendships, unstable job profiles. Gottfriedson and Hershey argued that people with low self-control tend to be little interested in and also unprepared for long-term occupational pursuits. Crimes require, generally, little skill or planning. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that the cognitive requirements for most crimes are minimal. You can probably see one criticism of self-control theory with this element because some crimes, such as some white-collar crimes, require a lot of planning and brain power to pull them off. Nevertheless, most crimes do tend to be crimes of opportunity with little skill or planning necessary. Such crimes do not require cognitive or academic skills. So Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that people with low self-control do not value cognitive or academic skills. Likewise, they argue that the manual skills required for crime are also minimal. So would-be criminals with low self-control don't invest in manual training or apprenticeships either. Crime often results in pain or discomfort for the victim. Property is lost or destroyed, people get hurt, trust is broken. People with low self-control tend to be self-centered, indifferent, or insensitive to the suffering and needs of others, Gottfriedson and Hershey argued. They're not antisocial, per se. In fact, people with low self-control might find that being charming and gregarious and generous gets them easy and immediate rewards at the expense of others. 
But the argument is they're going to be less concerned about the pain or discomfort for other people. Crimes often offer relief from momentary irritation, they argue. The major benefit of crimes is not necessarily pleasure, but the relief of irritation. For example, Gottfriedson and Hershey argued that the irritation caused by a crying child is often the stimulus for physical abuse. They argued that people with low self-control have minimal tolerance for frustration and they tend to respond to conflict through physical means instead of talking it out. Crimes involve the risk of violence and physical injury, of, of pain and suffering to the offender also. So people who are tolerant of physical pain or are indifferent to physical discomfort will be more likely to engage in criminal acts. Not that people with low self-control are necessarily more tolerant of physical pain, but that people who are less sensitive to pain are more likely to engage in activities that bring the risk of pain like many criminal activities. So what's the cause of low self-control? They're arguing that self-control is really what drives criminal behavior. So where do we learn self-control? What's the cause of self-control? According to Gottfriedson and Hershey, low self-control is not caused by training. It's not like we're trained or socialized into low self-control. They argue that the characteristics of low self-control show themselves precisely when training and socialization is absent, when we don't have adequate training or socialization. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that the main differences in self-control come from two sources. First, innate variation in children. So they acknowledge that there are some innate predictors for criminal behavior. They argue that these are kind of weak or moderate correlations, but nonetheless, they note that things like low intelligence and greater physical strength could relate to differences in self-control. But the bigger factor, they argue, is the differences in how caregivers recognize and correct low self-control in children. So the primary factor causing low self-control is ineffective child rearing. Gottfriedson and Hershey point out that discipline, supervision, and affection tend to be missing in the homes of delinquents. So their argument is that to teach self-control, primary caregivers must monitor the child's behavior, must recognize that the behavior is deviant, and must punish that behavior. But raising children with self-control can go wrong in four ways, they argued. First, parents may not care for the child. Although we assume all parents love their children and are invested in the welfare or behavior of their children, this is not always the case. Some parents don't have strong affection for their own children. Then second, parents, even if they care, they may not have the time or energy to monitor their child's behavior. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that the ability of parents to supervise their children is a major predictor of delinquency. Third, even if they care and they monitor the child, parents may not see anything wrong with the child's behavior. So the child may be acting out and the parents don't think that that's a wrong behavior or a delinquent behavior, or they may not think that it reflects low self-control. Fourth, even with all those factors in place, parents may not have the inclination or the means to punish the child. Gottfriedson and Hershey argue that disapproval by people one cares about is the most powerful of sanctions, but not that all caretakers punish effectively. Some parents are too harsh and some parents are too lenient. Either one can interfere with the ability to create high levels of self-control. Although Gottfriedson and Hershey argued that the family was the primary source for self-control, they did argue that people who are not sufficiently socialized by the family may learn self-control through the operation of other sanctioning systems or institutions, especially school. They argued that school may be more effective at monitoring than family, given the teacher's job to monitor children. Teachers generally recognize deviant or disruptive behavior 
and perhaps can do so more easily than parents. Teachers also have a clear interest in maintaining order in the classroom, and they have the authority and the means to punish children who act out. If school is unsuccessful at teaching self-control, Gottfriedson and Hershey argue it is because there's too little cooperation between the family and the school. Nevertheless, the net effect of school, they argue, is positive. Overall, school is an effective way to teach children self-control. So that's it for self-control theory, which they argue is really the root cause of crime. So the argument is to develop self-control in children so that they grow up and they don't offend. Well, that's it. That's the end of our discussion about control theories. I hope you learned a lot. I'll see you next time.